This is Rosa Shaw, and I'm here to guide you to the daily activities, events, and the in and zone outs of what occurs on the street. So sit back, relax, enjoy your cup of coffee, purchase one of the something on box, and enjoy a word from the metaverse. And welcome to another episode of A Word from the Metaverse. I'm your guide here, Rosa Shaw, speaking to you from a small cafe adjacent to the famous Black Sun Bar, giving you on the latest of what's happening on the street and affecting us here in the metaverse. This episode's topic is about um, Isaac Asimov, um, writer, um, early high, um, science fiction writer, most noted for um, developing and creating um, a series of books about robots, basically creating the genre that are the genre of robots in science. Um, more importantly, creating um, being known for one of the first writers to develop a a multiverse where all his um, books connected into a, a single type of I want to say multiverse that's not the, the right word um, a single uh, unifying universe of uh, all his science fiction stories um, feed into a an overall um, arching narrative if you will um, much of his books have been inspirations for real uh, scientific achievements if you look at any of the type of robotics that you see um, in the world, you will find that many scientists um, were inspired by reading books that Isaac Asimov written, as well as the ethical questions and dilemmas that he brought out about the usage of robotics and its placement in the world, particularly the fact that they are, robots were used as um, automation tools and an allegory, if you will, for um, slavery or slave labor. He's also known for creating a one of his um, well-known uh, science fiction series called Foundation, which talked about the usage of basically data um, to predict the future, um, a mathematical formula, if you will, to predict the narrative of human existence and how the, this data mining, if you will, could guide uh, human beings to live a better existence. Many of these uh, scientific Thoughts and ideas um, that he generated are now being um, put forth in the world. Um, data mining is a big deal. Um, robots are supplanting more and more with automation um, actual workers. And the way our society is being um, tailored or geared towards uh, automation and um, individuals are doing less and less um manual labor but as well as what are considered soft skills like accounting even lawyering if you will um, is changing and some of these um, dilemmas and ethical uh, issues and the the very nature of the shaping of um, society uh, were brought up in Eisen, Eisenhower's um, novels and he's often his, uh, his novels are often referred to as dystopian novels because it doesn't exactly paint the best picture of human existence with his automation automation and robotics so we're just going to cover some of his books um what he achieved where he came from and more in particular because um of the current state of american politics we're going to talk about one of his characters the mule but before we get into um as and off um the news the news this comes from arisa technica ibn gets a patent on out-of-office email messages in 2017. The U.S. Patent Office sees no history, hears no history, unless it's a patent. By Joe Mullen. The Electronic Frontier Foundation is bringing light to what it calls a stupefying mundane patent on email technology given to a patent troll hiding in a small office, but to one of the world's largest technology corporations. IBM lawyers wrangled with the U.S. Patent and Trade Mark office for years over a bizarre and alarming alternate turn of the history in which IBM invented out of the office email in 2010. U.S. patent number 9,547,842. Out of the office electronic mail messaging system was filed in 2010 and granted about six weeks ago. The invention represents in the um, Dash 842 patent is starkly at odds with the real history of technology, accessible in this case via a basic Google search. The EFF lawyer Daniel Nazar, who wrote about the 842 patent in this month's student patent 
Stuart Patton on the month blog post points to an article on Microsoft's publicity page that talks about a quirky out of email culture dating back to the 1980s when Microsoft marketed its Xenix email system, the predecessor to the exchange. The IBM offers one feature that even arguably not decades ago. Oh, wait, hold on. I kind of skipped here. Nope. Uh, the ability to notify those writing to the out of office users some days before the set vacation date began. This feature is sim- similar to sending a postcard not from a vacation to let someone know you will go on vacation. It is a trivial change to existing system, Nazar points out. But patent lawyers have long been able to add trivial features to well-known technologies in order to get software patent grants. Uh, We're going to talk about this um, further on next episode when we talk about copyright. And then eventually we'll talk about the patent system in general. Because currently right now these very antiquated systems are just really incompatible with the, the way technology has gone, the way society is, and just 20, the 21st century in general. And going further. Um, but I digress. Nasser goes on to identify some major mistakes made during the examination process. The examiner never considered whether the software claims were eligible after the Supreme Court's Alice versus CLS bank decision, which came in 2014, and Nasser views the office did an abysmal job of looking at the prior art. The examiner considered only patents and patent applications, notes Nasser. The office never considered any of the many, many existing real-world systems that predate IBM's application. Today, IBM is one of the companies pushing Congress to roll back Alice and allow more types of software patents. Um, if they succeed, perhaps IBM can finally get a patent or a shorter, me- shorter meetings, right? NASA referred to an actual IBM application was rejected as overly abstract. Uh, one of the things about Alice was that you couldn't really patent abstract ideas. And, the, and a lot of software companies, um, major ones, are very much against this concept because um, software programs are considered abstract ideas um, by the court system in general. Uh, today, okay, so there has been an update asked by the EFF criticisms of the patent, and IBM spokesman spokesman said that the IBM had decided to dedicate the patent to the public. The company notified the USPTO today that its local goal is right to the patent. So it got about a, a lot of heat on this particular email patent, and most likely there was going to, you know, people were firing up uh, all sorts of different um, lawsuit claims. Imagine like Google and Apple and every pretty much every email provider um, was talking to their lawyers about this particular patent and was about to sue IBM. Not to mention the bad publicity that uh, the company would have gotten for this just really just shoot and patent patent idea. And like I said, we'll, we're going to talk about copyright and then eventually we're going to talk about the patent system and how it's just, it's just broken, really, in general. Uh, thousands of ICU detainees claim that they were forced into labor, a violation of anti-slavery laws by Christina Phillips. Uh, this comes from the Washington Post. Tens of thousands of immigrants detained by the U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement were forced to work for a dollar a day or for nothing at all, a violation of federal anti-slavery laws and lawsuit claims. Um, if you haven't seen it already, I highly recommend watching Netflix's um, 13th. It's a documentary by Ava DuVay covering the 13th Amendment and about the prison system and how slavery can technically still legally exist um, within America. Um, and I'm wondering if this were with ISIS, if this is, um, this particular prison system, if this is applicable to them. Um, the 13th Amendment allowed for prisoners to be put and forced, forced to labor. Um, and it's not a violation of the slavery clause. I'm just kind of giving you a constitutional, by the sketch, very, very, very wicked sketch out of that particular amendment. Uh, the lawsuit filed in 2014 against one of the largest private prison companies in the country reached a class action status this week after a federal judge ruling that means that the case could involve as many as 60,000 immigrants who have been detained. In the first time, a class action lawsuit accused a private U.S. prison company of forced labor has been allowed to move forward. The obviously a big deal is recognizing the possibility that the government contractor could be engaging in forced labor through Nina Dosalvo. Executive Director of Towards Justice, a Colorado-based nonprofit group 
that represents low-wage workers, including undocumented immigrants. Certification of the class is perhaps the only mechanism by way which these vulnerable individuals who were dispersed across the country and across the world would never be able to vindicate their rights. At the heart of the dispute is the Denver Contract Detention Facility, a 1,500-bed center in Aurora, Colorado, owned and operated by GEO Group under a contract with ISIS, a Florida-based corporation that runs facilities to house immigrants who are waiting their return in court. The lawsuit filed against GEO Group on behalf of the nine immigrants initially sought more than $5 million in damages. Attorneys expect the damages to grow substantially, giving the case new class, class action status. The class action ruling by U.S. District Judge John Keenan means that as many as 60,000 current and former detainees at the detention facility in Aurora and now part of the lawsuit without having to actively join as plaintiffs, said Andrew Free, one of the plaintiff's attorneys. The lead plaintiff in the case is a permanent resident of the U.S. and the attorney expects a significant portion of the class will fit that bill, Free said. The original nine plaintiffs claim that the detainees in ISIS facilities are forced to work without pay and that those who refuse to do are threatened with solitary confinement. Specifically, the lawsuit claims that six detainees are selected at random every day and are forced to clean the facility housing units. The lawsuit claims that the practice violates the Federal Trafficking Victims Protection Act, which prohibits modern-day slavery. Forced labor is particularly particularly violation of the state that we've alleged. Whether you call it a forced labor or slavery, the particular reality for plaintiffs is much the same. You're being compelled to work against your will on the threat of force or the use of force. The GEO group also accused of violating Colorado's minimum wage laws by paying detainees $1 a day instead of the state's minimum wage about $9 an hour. The company unjustly enriched itself through the cheap labor of detainees, the lawsuit said. None of the original nine plaintiffs are still detained at the facility, the law said. The class ruling, class action ruling by Kane, a senior judge in the U.S. District Court in Colorado, came at a critical time during the President Trump plunge to deport two to three million undocumented immigrants. Advocates say that private prison companies that have government contracts stand to benefit significantly from President the president's hardline policy of detaining deporting a massive number of immigrants. That means you need to round up and detain more people in order to determine whether they have rights to stay in the country before you deport them. Many people could be moving through not just in the rural facility, many people could be subject to the GEO's forced labor policy. And the article kind of just goes on, but I just wanted to cover the fact that this is something that is currently going on right here in the state. Uh, this is from Wired called by Liz Stinson, The bar- Bizarre Digital Book You Must Destroy Before Sharing. Owning a physical book is different from owning a digital book. With a physical book, you can highlight its text, dog ears, pages, and give it to a friend who you know will never return it. Digital books don't work that way. You don't own them so much as you borrow them for my indefinite period of time. There's also no scribbling, dog earing, or leaning out. And the pages of digital books remain after countless reads, just as pristine as the first time you flipped through them. Unless you happen to be reading a universe explodes. The book written by a Google, Google employee, uh, T. U. Good, developed by a design studio in Possible Labs and published by Edition at Play, is actually more of a web app. You access through a browser like you would any other website, turn its 20 pages requiring a tap, not unlike a novel or your Kindle or your Kindle, but a universe exposed isn't a typical book. In fact, it's pretty damn weird. What sets a universe exposed apart is how it, you access it. We want to see if you can make a limited edition digital book, says Ann Gruber, co-founder of Editions at Play. The idea stands at odds with how the internet usually works. Most content on the web is open to whoever wants to access it. If it's not, then it usually locked down accessible by password only. The universe exposed sits somewhere between those two. Anyone can read the book, but only a select number can own it. Ownership as a concept is surrounded by a set of complex questions. Does the physical possession constitute ownership, or is it more of a legal term? Does there have to be an exchange of money, and what happens when you give someone give something away? Computer, the internet, the fast, the widespread sharing of information, these have all compounded the confusion. With digital work, it's almost impossible to get the sense of who owns it, Ugo says. A universe exposed is an experiment with means to own digital book. Let us ex- explain how this works, because it gets sort of complicated. Only 100 people own the original version of the universe exposed, but each of those copies can be passed on to friends via email. The book, which has 128 words per page, can be handed off from a friend to up to 100 times. 
There's a cache though. Before an owner can give her version away, she must remove two words and add one to every page, creating a personalized limited edition of the book. I find this very a fascinating experiment. I think there needs to be a change with the whole uh, ebook system and in general, particularly with the whole ownership of the ebook. But this is just fascinating of the way uh, technology can intersect with a with a system here. I'm just going to go on a little bit and then we're going to move on. Uh, that means the version of the universe get explodes I give to you will look different from the version I just first received. And the version you give to your friend will be differently from the version they, they, they give to their friend. With every iteration of the book, more words disappear until there's only one word left on each page. And frankly, after 20 owners, it will be unreadable. These changes are saved to a public database using blockchain. The technology is the backbone of Bitcoin. Explain simply, blockchain, and we already know what blockchain is. In the case of the universe explodes, it's more about tracking creativity than the transaction itself. You go and compare the book's ledger to a library card. You can see who's read the book and how they change it, and even you can't change the book yourself. From the website, readers can trace the, dev uh, the devolution of, the, of all 100 original volumes as each is edited and passed down by its respective owner. So this is just very fascinating. It would be interesting to see how uh, this develops. Uh, this article comes from Hackaday, Flying the First Open Source Satellite by Brian Bishikoff. Uh, the Library Space Foundation, an organization dedicated to the development of library space hardware, it was born from the Sat Nogs project, the winners of the first Hackaday Prize, and now this foundation is in space. The Library Space Foundation hitched a ride on the orbital ATK launch yesterday, and right now they are completely open source CubeSat is on its way to the International Space Station. The CubeSat in question is the UPC Sat, a 2U CubeSat that's completely open source. Everything from the chassis to the firmware is completely open, with all the source files hosted on GitHub. The UPSat is currently on its way to the International Space Station, stowed in the orbital ATK Syngis cargo spacecraft. From here, the UPC at SAT will be unloaded by members of the current ISIS expedition deployed with the help from NanoRacks. Basically, the first open source satellite will be tossed overboard from the International Space Station. If you want to listen in on the data, the AppSat is beaming down. Build a SAT NOGS ground station and tune into 435.765 um, megahertz. With a good antenna, you'll be able to hear it when the ad when the ISIS is in the sky, or a few times a week. You can check out the launch on the Sargus UPC sat is flying in the video below. NASA has already recorded a 360-degree video for the launch pad that unfortunately cuts out in the first few seconds of the launch. So this is just fascinating. It's another um, step in the best direction for open source, open source hardware, open source software and the changing of um, the privatization of space, but privatization in a way where there's more direct and complete and open access for the public. And that is it for the news. On to the main story, which is about um, Asimov. So we're gonna talk about Isaac Asimov, a dystopian future. And basically the reason why I'm bringing this up is uh, he's considered one of the big three in science fiction. It's um, him, uh, Arthur C. Clarke, Robert Hillman, that's really the foundation work upon which uh, a lot of writers um, either have a jumping off point or take the things that they were missing within these um, great architects of the science fiction world and add it, and add it to the science fiction fantasy. He, he does have a bit of an influence on that cyberpunk um, world as well as the real world as far as um, his concept of robotics and data mining, as we talked about in our connection. Now, um, while I stated earlier that his robotics were very simplified, you know, it was a bit of an allegory for slavery, it's not exactly quite as true because while his world viewpoint or his world that he built, built within his science fiction realm was very simplified, um, there is a perception because of the simplification of it that there's two points where he didn't really address the socioeconomics of automation of robotics and what was being done with the robots per se. Um, and then there are those that have the interpretation that he allowed for the the reader to to 
make those inferences himself. And if you read the, um, he has a different, he, he, this man wrote 500 books. And one of the series of books that he wrote was called Spacer, which dealt with the, the robotics aspect of it. And they were uh, within the world, a human civilization, if you will. Not to go too deep before we talk about the actual author. But uh, uh, we'll just, we'll talk about Isaac first and then we'll, we'll kind of get into his works. But so Isaac Asimov, and I'm going to read him from Wikipedia, um, was an American writer and professor of biochemistry at Boston University. Uh, he was known for his science fiction and popular science. Uh, he was a very prolific writer. Uh, he wrote and edited more than 500 books and estimated 90,000 letters and postcards. His books have been published in nine out of ten major categories of the Dewey Decimal Codification, and we'll get back to that uh, when we talk about, address that issue. Um, he is considered one of the big three um, science fiction writers during his lifetime. Uh, his most famous work is the Foundation series, uh, which um, we'll talk about that deals with data mining and the character of the novel, um, the Galactic Empire series, and the Robot series. Uh, the, the Galactic Empire novels are explicitly set in an earlier history of the same fictional universe as the Foundation histories. Uh, and later, beginning with Foundation Edge, Edge implemented his distant future to the robot and spacer stories. Uh, he created a, a unified future history for his stories, much like uh, the Pioneer by Robert Helen and previously produced by uh, Corner Smith and Paul Anderson. So he's one of the earlier writers that created this like shared metaverse of all the writings and something that inspired a lot of them are a number of other writers should do the same so my first one read is um, uh, Stephen King and his oh, one of the scariest writers out there linking you know, all his books particularly to that of the omnibus series of you could say the the bigger the big huge lengthy series that of the dark towers uh, he wrote hundreds of short stories, including this, the social science fiction Nightfall, which in 1964 was voted by uh, science fiction writers in America as the best short science fiction story. Um, let's see. Uh, he was a longtime member of President of the International. He has an asteroid named after him, a crater on the planet Mars, a book in elementary school, and a literary award is named after him, Stephen Helms. Let's see. Um, I want to read, mention about this uh, a little bit about this because he is such a big um, science guy in general. I mean, he wrote about science. He advocated for science, and um, it's very interesting. We'll talk a little bit about some of his quotes and things that he believed in that um, he had. His family had to do this, um, and he himself had to keep this hidden. But given the time and the era that um, he lived in, he he had to, and it's. As years have passed and this particular part of um, human history or is, is um, passing along, you're finding out more and more people that are from this period of time that died, um, had died from this illness. So, Asimov suffered a heart attack in 1977 and had a triple bypass surgery in December 1983, during which he contracted the HIV from blood transfusion. When his HIV status was understood, his physicians warned that if he publicized it, the anti-AIDS prejudice would likely extend to his family members. Uh, when he died in New York City on April 6, 1992, uh, he was survived by his brother Stanley, his second wife Janet Asimov, and his children from his first marriage. Uh, Stanley reported the cause of death as heart and kidney failure. Uh, the family chose not to disclose that those that these were the com- complication of the AIDS because within two days um, of his basically with his passing. Uh, on April 8th, author Ash announced his own HIV infection, also contracted in 1983 from a blood transfusion during heart blood bypass surgery, which resulted in much public controversy. Um, I remember this controversy, and author Ash is one of the, one of the people that made it possible for um, people living with HIV virus to be public and be forthright. I mean, she's a come to the illness uh, but I remember this controversy and all the negative and horrible things that were said at the time. Uh, ten years later after most of Asimov's physicians had died uh, his children, Janet and Robin Asimov, agreed that the HIV story should be made public. Uh, Janet revealed in her new mission of the autobiography has been a good life. 
Uh, the reason why I bring this up is that um, one of the biggest quotes that I think I have to think about, there's a cult of, there's a cult, the cult of ignorance in the United States, and there has always been a strain of, a strain of anti-intellectualism has been a constant threat winding its way through our political and cultural life, nurtured by the false notion that democracy means that my ignorance is just as good as your knowledge. Um, it's just very sad to say that this very thoughtful, um, big scientific mind has been able to keep that a secret because of the ignorance of the culture of people. Uh, but as I was trying to expound upon earlier, um, as of a, you know, he's not without his controversies when it comes to his writings. Kind of going down here, so, uh, Asimov sometimes was considered criticized for his general absence of sexuality and for extraterrestrial life in science fiction. Uh, he claimed he wrote the gods himself to respond to his criticism, which often came from a new wave science fiction and often British writers. Uh, the second part of the three of three of his novels set on alien world were three sexes and the sexual behavior of the creature he specifically depicted. Um, alien life, Asimov wants to explain the recognition willingness to write about aliens was an implicit alien's career, career when his astounding editor John Campbell rejected one of his science fiction stories because the alien characters were portrayed as superior to humans. The nature of the rejection led him to believe that Campbell may have based his bias towards human stories on real world racial bias. Unwilling to write only weak alien races and concerned that a com- confirmation would jeopardize his and Campbell's friendship, he decided he would not write about aliens at all. Nevertheless, in response to these criticisms, he wrote The Gods Himself, which contained aliens and alien sex. Uh, Asimov said that, that of all his writings, he's most proud of the middle section of The Gods Himself, the part that deals with those, those things. Uh, betrayal of Women. Um, Asimov was criticized for his lack of strong female characters in earlier work. Uh, his autobiographical writings, such as Gold for Women in Science Fiction, he acknowledged this and responds by pointing to his inexperience. His later novel was written with more female characters, but essentially the same prose style as his early science fiction story brought this matter to a wider audience. For example, August 25th, 1984, uh, the Washington Post book World section reports of robots and empires as well. In 1940s, Asimov's humans were stripped down, masked at the tor- torches in, in America since 1940s, and they still are. His robots were tin cans, his speed guns like an old scooter baker, and still are. The robots' tails have been on and increasingly. Unworkable distinctions between movable and un- unmovable artificial intelligence and still do. In Asimov's universe, because it's, it was conceived a long time ago and because its author had pulled his confusion, there is no computers whose impact is worth noting, no social complexities, no gen- genetic engineering, aliens, argyles, multiverse, clones, sin, or sex. His heroes, in the case of R. Daniel Orwell, whom we first met as a robot protagonist of The Cave of Steel and its sequels, feel no pressure of information while are cooked. And as the symbolists do today, they suffer no deformation from the names of Asimov's future because it's so deeply and strikingly elderly. So, you know, he, he has his uh, shortcomings, if you will. But his impact, um, just in general, on sci fi and its influence and inspiration of people is still, it has a, it's a bit of a crater, just like the one on Mars. Um, it still influences people to this very day. And does have an influence into the, the cyberpunk um, realm as far as aesthetics and even to some of the lacking of earlier um, science fiction writers and the things and subjects that they didn't discuss or talk about were being discussed um, in other forms of sci- science fiction when it comes to the cyber, um, cyberpunk world. About the, not just the dystopia, um, which most cyberpunk. Um, writings are kind of set in, but the aspect of sexuality, of oppression, economic woes, racial woes, things of that nature are um, more explicitly written about in the novels. On the back, on to the fact about his um, 500 books, um, this comes from McCor. Is it true that Isaac Adnoff is the only author to have written a book in every three decimal category? So if someone came with an answer, uh, that person would share a goal. Uh, Asimov is one of the most prolific writers of all time. I've written and edited more than 500 books and estimated 90,000 letters and postcards. 
here are the 10 major categories of the DDSM system you need to consider when preparing for your uh, zero zero is generalities, 100 is philosophy, 200 religion, 300 social science, 400 languages, 500 pure science, 600 applied science and technology, 700 arts, 800 literature, and 900 history and geography. Technically, his works have been in all 10 major categories of the Dewey Decimal Seven system. However, it's not true that he's written a book in each of them. This is his only work in the 100s, uh, which covers philosophy, psychology, was a forward for the humanist way. He did write books in all other nine major categories, though with the least number of books in the 400 sh- two titles, uh, 703 titles and 287 titles. So religion, he has seven, the 700 was arts, and the 400 was dealing with religion. So that's very, very, very impressive. And you can see why he had uh, such an impact on the science fiction realm itself. So on Hiroshima Thought Level, um, we're going to do a review of both of these books, um, Robot Vision and Robot Dream by Isaac Abernathy, as well as uh, he had a magazine that he ran that was called the Asimov Magazine, um, a collection of essays that he wrote. Well, we're going to talk about his essays because they range from all sorts of different types of subjects from philosophy to science and even just the, the concept of science fiction and him breaking it down. I think it's just important as a person who who loves cyberpunk and loves science fiction um, to have an understanding of his writings and how some people may have countered his concepts and things that he was speaking about and the different shifts in, um, in the science fiction realm. Because he started writing in the 1940s, he passed away in the 19, 1992, so he was writing for over 50 years, and there's in that span of time, you know, a lot has changed in the world, if you will, of both you know, culturally, uh, spiritually, economically, and it was reflected in the art as a whole as it does. So, why Asimov he was kind of in the both the utopian and dystopian type of a category. Um, he's he always his viewpoint of technology as being the solution to mankind was very simplified, if you will. He was an optimist. He did believe in um, mankind prevailing and succeeding and, and overcoming his shortcomings. Um, but the manner upon which he wrote his robot series and the Foundation series and um, it's not exactly a, a world that the, the people may want to have lived in. And it's very important because it predicted a, a concept and ideas or a vision of a world that allowed for Avene, um, robots to basically slowly, as the series progressed, to take over every single aspect of human existence. So Asimov, uh, as he wrote, or not wrote, but spoke about in his writings, his famous series, there were three. The Galactic Empire, the Foundation series and uh, the robotic series. So I'm going to read this article from Slate, which talks about his first book, uh, The Caves of Steel, which is within the robotic series. And then we'll expound about how that was a beginning or a sense of a kind of a dystopian world, if you will. Even if um, Asanoff himself didn't necessarily meant it to be dystopian, um, is kind of viewed as such. So as in his laws of longevity, the science fiction legend on the downsides of living a long life by Constus, Constantine Chaos. Isaac Asimov was a former science fiction writer in the second half of the 20th century. He was notoriously prolific, churning out hundreds of books, and late in life he reflected, I wanted to write fictional history in which there are no true endings, in which even when a problem is apparently solved, a new one rises to take its place. To this end, I sacrificed everything else. Asimov's style was that of a pulp he came up in, and his characters by his own admission is cutouts. His prose not subtle, but he's very good at what he set out to be good at. Uh, positioning uh, technological solutions to societal problems and then figuring out what new problems these solutions entailed. His laws of robotics, a scheme of virtuous automation, was one such exploration. Because he explicitly wrote three laws, they were 
refied in the canon of science fiction if process helped along uh, when Will Smith proposed their limits in a film adaptation. But Asanoff was only concerned not only with robots, but also with the implication of a longer human lifespan. If we're going to talk about the social and political consequences of longer lives, as Future Tense is doing with a special package, then we should listen to Asanoff, who suggests longevity leads to selfishness and status. So this is something that people have talked about, and we'll, I will say the, what the three laws are, too. Um, that the longer that we live, um, that perhaps the greater issues when it comes to societal bonds, if you will, if we live so long, um, will we be doing the same activities that we have always been doing? What will our health look like? Um, all sorts of kind of societal implications when it comes with a longer lifespan, if you will. Uh, the three laws are the following. Uh, the first law is a robot may not injure a human being or through inaction allow a human being to come to harm. A robot must obey orders given it by humans except where such orders would conflict with the first law. And the third law is a robot must protect its own existence as long as such protections does not conflict with the first or second law. And this is something you might have seen or have talked about in um, you know popular culture and even with uh, discussion about robotics today as far as um, them being weaponized or used in the home or things of that nature if there are some type of ethical laws or dilemmas to prevent robots from you know turning on their masters if you will. Uh, the murder mystery of the, clay was, the Caves of Steel was Asanoff's first big success as a novelist. In this book, the victim is a robotics, robotics, roboticist from Aurora, the first of 50 planets colonized by explorers from Earth, uh, dubbed Spacers. The first colonists were selected for their abilities and so were healthier than average. Their ships were sterilized and so brought no disease with them. The Spacers had become sort of a galactic upper class, more technologically, technologically advanced and military powerful than those left on the overpopulated, resource-strained Earth. While Earthlings lived at about the same age we experience today, the Spacers expected much lengthier lifespan. The contrast is highlighted by Eli, uh, Elijah Bailey, a police detective on Earth, and Hans uh, Fossa, an Aurorian politician who was a cogweed of the murdered victim. Uh, Fast Luth expects to live to be between uh, 300 and 350, but he is wary of the drawbacks of such a long life. If you were to die now, he says to Bailey, you would lose perhaps 40 years of your life, probably less. If I were to die, I would lose 150 years, probably more. Uh, Fast Luth goes on to sketch out for Bailey the most the mores of Auroran society. The birth rate is kept low. Developing children are carefully screened for physical and mental defects before being allowed to mature, and humans constitute a sort of leisure class with all the labor done by robots. Uh, Bailey is horrified by all this, but not for the same reasons as uh, Fastluff, who is troubled by his society's sustainability. It's possible to be, to be too stable, he says, in a roaring culture. Individual life is of prime importance. Aurorans are, in his view, unable to collaborate with one another, and too risk averse because of their longevity. Um, Asanoff followed the Caves of Steel three years later with The Naked Sun, in which Bailey travels to Solora, another spacer world. Whereas Aurora boasts 50 robots for every person, on Solora there are 10,000 for each individual. On Solora there's a strong taboo against physical contact, which is thought to be inherently dirty, and the 20,000 residents view one another by by sort of a hologram video conference. Solorians, even more than Aurorans, are devoted to individual conference. The Solorians, in their splendid isolation, have no police detective. That's why they called on Bailey for mirth. Until the murder of the, murder of the story, they claim to have come have uh, no crime. We are in Solarian have no experience with these things in the ways we don't understand people. There are too few of us here, a Solarian leader tells Bailey. Uh, the Solarians are individuals wealthy and long-lived, but they do not innovate or really love. Uh, Bailey returns to Earth and reports to his superiors. When you ordered me to Solara, you asked a question. You asked what the weakness of the outer worlds were. 
Their strength were their robots and their low population and long lives. But what were their weaknesses? And Bailey paused before delivering his punchline. The weakness, sir, are their robots, their low population, and their long lives. Uh, it took Asanoff 30 years to complete his trilogy with The Robot of Dawn, published in 1983, which takes place on Aurora. Uh, Bailey goes to Aurora to solve the murder of a robot. On his trip there, he heads up. He reads up on the planet's history. As the roaring lifespan grew longer over the course of generations, he finds their history grows more and more boring. As they live longer and longer lives, Aurorians do less and less. A Solarian woman with whom he falls in love tells him, when you live several centuries, you have plenty of time to lose thousands of things. Be thankful for short life. Asimov, though, is concerned not with individual, but with macro effects of long life, which he portrays as, as, as studifying. Aurorian scientists have three or three and a half, half centuries to devote to a problem so that the thought arises that significant progress might be made in a time by solitary work. It becomes possible to feel a kind of intellectual greed to want to accomplish something on your own, and general advance is slow on space or worlds as a result. Uh, it's easy to dismiss as announced imaginations are unrealistic. Earth in the Caves of Steel had a population of 8 billion, scaling more than the present population. The only way to grow enough food to support the population is through giant vats of yeast, and Asanoff claims that the population is far too large for conventional agricultural to suffice. But much, but much of what he predicts resonates in small ways. Nobody now lives in isolation of Solaran, yet my office is filled with people who prefer to send emails to one another instead of walking 10 seconds to briefly converse. Uh, I see that this is not atypical. The children of the privilege are raised in structured, sheltered environments that have more of common feel with Asimov's aurora filled with individual strivers than they do with the Earth of Caves, in which kids roughhouse harmlessly blowing off steam in a shinier version of the 1950s. His books are useful ethnological progress. Earth will never become Aurora, but the tonier parts of Silicon Valley are already starting to resemble it. As an honest view, part of the task of science fiction as a custom, accustoming readers to the ideas of change to the knowledge that things will be different, and so help them to plan change with wisdom. And part of that wisdom is undertaking a healthy skepticism and technological fixes to problems like aging. Which is something, you know, it's very interesting. There's been a study that um, showed that uh, there's certain antigens in uh, teenagers' blood that if you give to an older person, it helps uh, reverse aging. And it's something that uh, is being studied about. And all the, there's all these different types of studies to try to stop aging. It's something that um, people are actively seeking to do. But... Part of the dystopian view here with the whole uh, automation or robotics is as in us, um, more of his space stories happen as he wrote more about this particular area as part of his robot series. Uh, the people known as spacers, um, there were two groups of humans. There were spacers and there were, um, I think they were called travelers. They, they didn't believe in robotics. They believed that man should do their work themselves and not leave it to automation. And so they rejected robots and didn't allow robots on their own worlds. Um, especially when um, Earth didn't become as feasible um, in the robotic series. And um, <clears throat> when the Galactic Empire and the Foundation, the robots weren't feasible to be on their planet. Um, because of this human division, what ended up happening on the spacer worlds, like places like Aurora, and their long life is, a, especially with um, Aurora, where they didn't allow for um, human contact, uh, in that uh, humans' existence or whatever you might you might call it. these group of people that it came to a point they would their home space and everything that needed to be done was fulfilled by the robots, their food, their growing, their electricity, their thinking, their education, uh, even their communication to eventually where they didn't really even communicate with other Aurorians. They just stayed within their own space and dwelled within their own world, um, alone amongst them by themselves, living a very long life. Um, their shape and form actually even changed to where the more of a sedentary, where they didn't even move as much. They have, were living like a kind of a sedentary um, 
existent. And have you ever seen the, that movie Wally by Disney, the, the Pixar movie, where um, the humans that lived up in space that Wally was serving as he was trying to clean up and find viable life, um, plant life on Earth, that the humans that lived in the cruise ship kind of lived that kind of aurora existence where they didn't move much, that it was all about pleasure, if you will. It was all about uh, selfish pursuits. And they went around in these like kind of space age um, old people carts, the little traveling carts that older people have to utilize to get around the old people scooters. And there are some people that perceive that this could possibly in essence kind of happen one aspect with animation is that what are humans going to do with their existence particularly given the fact that we are living longer than previous human civilization you know aspects of human civilization have and even as we progress longer where people are very active in their 70s and 80s where even 20 or 30 years ago You wouldn't see as many active 70 or 80 year olds or even 90 year olds, if you will. There's more and more people being found to have um, reaching towards 100. I believe it was just like two weeks ago, um, a woman um, was like the last person born um, in the 19th century. Uh, She passed away at 118 years old something of that nature she was born in eight, um, 1899 and so because of, of our longevity the fact that we're living healthier lives that we're combating diseases with the fact that we're able to treat them even cure them to exist to some extent and the fact that automation is something that's becoming more pervasive in life the the viewpoint that technology will be this type of almost a utopiaish type of space if you will it's it's very weird because um in asimov's novels he demonstrates that technology allows for people to be in space and for them to have this animation and you have these robotics and you have um all these things happening where they're the spacers are extremely wealthy and have this very great privilege but they also live very long lives and they don't really do much so you have this really strange contrast, if you will. So with the robotic series, he explores the usage of a robot's automation and how it changes, how new problems arise within um, human society because of this automation. And then in his next big series, the Foundation series, which also ties into the um, Galactic Empire, uh, Asimov thought of a concept of utilizing um, what he calls psychohistory, where it was a prediction of how to form and shape human existence. So this is from the Wicca, and then we'll get into it. Um, The Foundation series is a science fiction series of books written by Asimov. Um, For nearly 30 years, the series was a trilogy, Foundation, Foundation Empire, and Second Foundation. Um, and then he uh, began to add to the series in 1981 with two sequels, Foundations Ed, Edge and Foundation and Earth, and two prequels, Prelude to Foundation and Forward to Foundation. The additions made references to events in Asimov's Robot and Empire series, inca- indicating they were all in the same fictional universe. Uh, the premise of the series is that mathematician Harry Seldon spent his life developing a branch of mathematics known as psychohistory concept of mathematical psych- psychology using the laws of mass action it could predict the future by only but only on a large scale seldom foresee the imminent fall of the galactic empire which encompassed the entire milky way in a dark age lasting 30,000 years before a second great empire rises uh, seldon's calcula- calculations also show there's a way to limit this interim to just 1,000 years to ensure that the most more favorable outcome and reduce human misery during the interfering period, Seldon created a foundation of talented artisans and engineers at the extreme end of the galaxy, essentially to preserve and expand on human collective knowledge and thus becoming the foundation for a new galactic empire. 
but actually to place society in the way shown by his calculation to bring around the desired outcome, the Selden plan, he also established a second foundation of psychohistorians, on which little is known to build on his work further and to keep the better known first foundation on his intended course. So basically, this concept of human prediction, if you will, this data mining of human existence and then predicting it out forward is something that people have been trying to do for centuries. And it's something that mathematicians are, are attempting to do now, where you see things like predicting um, algorithms to try to predict the next terrorist attack or predicting you know, how the markets go up and down. Um, and so for some degree, there there are certain mathematical computations that can't predict certain aspects, but they can't predict everything, if you will. It is always up, up to do certain degrees. Um, but as more and more information is inputted, and as these um, mathematical uh, computations get more refined, um, they're becoming more and more um, capable of predicting certain aspects of a problem or solution. Um, there's also the concept of the wisdom of the crowd, where you allow people from all rocks of life to predict an outcome of something, like who's going to win the Super Bowl, who's, um, you know, and you have like, what was it, the Patriots versus the Falcons, and the wisdom of the crowd, you know, moved towards the Patriots, and of course the Patriots won, and there's a certain probability aspect to that, um, you see Arga, um, there's a couple blockchain technologies that wish to harness the the mathematical concept of the wisdom of the crowd through the blockchain technology and you know this concept of psychohistory uh, this predictive algorithm concept it was something that um, Asimov developed and put forth in the world and just the concept of data mining if you will which is what Selden uh, Harry uh, not Harry but yeah Harry Selden was doing to data mine, data mine human existence and coming with an algorithm to predict um, how human society should go forward and then try to shape it to something that's better instead of 30,000 years of darkness is only a thousand years um, has significant um, implications because data mining is done all the time our personal information is utilized by all sorts of different um, corporations to predict and determine like what type of ad buys we would go for, what are what best colors would be suited for a car, uh, things of that nature. Um, I believe Facebook did a did a thing where they did some data tinkering to push their users to one type of kind of viewpoint versus another. Uh, data mining was utilized in um, the state selection, the United States election during um, on behalf of the uh, Trump campaign to target and figure out, you know, what voters are thinking and utilizing that data to implement whatever type of policies and ad buys and, you know, the ground campaign that they were doing um, in the election. And it's something that's done by corporations, by individuals, by people. And it's becoming an increasing um, math solution, if you will, to the human problem of swaying someone to, to predict what they will think or do. Remove all that. So, the reason why I bring up the uh, found found foundation is that a lot of people compare um, or are beginning to pair, compare um, Trump to a character from this series of books. And this character is called the Mule. So the Mule is a fictional character from Eisenhower's Foundation series and comes from Wicca. Um, one of the greatest conquerors of the galaxy has ever seen. Uh, he's a melatonin who has the ability to reach into the minds of others and adjust their emotions individually or in mass using it, this capacity to he can strip individuals to his cause. Not direct mind control per se, per se, but in subtle influence of the subconscious Individuals under the mule's influence behave otherwise normally, logic, memories, and personal personalities intact. This gives the mule the capacity to disrupt uh, Selden's plan by invading Selden's assumption that no single individual 
could have a measurable effect on the galactic social his historical trends on their own due to the plan relying on the predictable actions of a very large number of people. So, Mimiu established his empire incrementally using past con consequences to add new ones, first by mentally converting a pirate band to his allegiance, then a whole planet, then the military powerful kingdom of Kagan, while obtaining the mental of converting the warlord to the planet Kanagan, and then the foundation. The mule set up his short-lived galactic empire, the Union of Worlds, styling himself the first citizen of the Union, and making Kagan his cap um, capital planet. Meeting up to for a good time after the mule's conquest of the foundation and his trade compared to almost no one ever actually sees the mule or knows what he looks like. Uh, the foundation at the death of the empire is a slow supplier of nuclear weaponry in the galaxy, and using this asset, the mule begins rapidly conquering surrounding territories, all which lack nuclear power, sweeping aside the remnants of the galactic empire centered on Mio Tantaran. So the mule was something that um, Selden's plan couldn't predict because his whole thing was about predicting the whole masses of human existence. That was the basis of the, his particular formula. And then you have this mule who um, comes in and just messes things up. So what does that have to do with Trump and why is he being compared to it? So many people, and I have a link in the article about it, um, they're comparing Trump to the mule in the sense that because so many people had predicted and all the algorithms and the polling um, and everything was that uh, Hillary Clinton was going to win the presidential election even before um really any GOP candidate was announced even even though Trump announced his candidacy very very early on I think it was like 2011 that he eventually wanted to run for the seat for the 2016 I think he actually officially declared in 2015 the fact that he came onto the scene he defeated all the different GOP candidates even though all the predictions either went from like Jeb to Rubio to um, whomever the, the other Republican candidates were. Everyone but him was going to get the uh, Republican nomination. And then he got the Republican nomination. And then it was predicted he wasn't going to win against Hillary. And, and because he was, he's considered an outsider, a businessman, a bit, bit of a buffoon, a kind of clownish in appearance, these are certain characteristics attributes that are associated that the mule presented himself so that people wouldn't take him seriously but he's actually really a very clever and very powerful person and that's why many people associate it um, because the character in himself the mule um, is capable is, is something that is an attribute that many associate with Trump is very manipulative type of a person able to persuade people to his cause and his side that uh, he's very much like the mule, that he disrupted whatever perceived plan the um, that people had. For, for, in fact, like, you know, the Democratic plan for Hillary to win, uh, the Republican plan for either uh, Rubio or, or Jeb Bush to win the Republican nomination, a disruptive force that none of the um, leading um thinkers, if you will, the leading pollsters and the numbers uh, reflected um, his presence, if you will, to win. So that's why he is something that bantered around in that comparison. I don't think it's an apt comparison to him, but I can see you if for some people they can perceive that, particularly if you're the thing of the thought that, you know, every, you know, everything is very organized and controlled and then the elite control every single aspect from the town from the top bottom there was a plan in place to place Hillary Clinton in charge and that you know Trump disrupted that if you will in general you know Isaac Adenoff had a very huge impact impact on science fiction writing his he basically invented the term robotics it was him he who came up with the term, his concepts about robotics and automation, um, how technology could be a solution for um, the world's problems or something that was discussed throughout his robot series and spacer series, the concept of psychohistory using, in essence, data mining, if you will, to kind of control 
a population or an outcome, something that he presented himself um, throughout that series of books, um, the, what was called the Selden Plan to shape human existence is something that's being done today. And while he was very optimistic in believing that humans can overcome their problems and issues and stuff like that, a lot of his books do have a, a reflection, if you look at it, of a kind of a dystopian world where you don't want to live in a world where everything's kind of planned out, where you lived, a, you know, 350 years and don't really do much. Uh, you don't engage or interact. Uh, robots do everything for you. Um, you have a society that rejects automation in a sense. Um, become travelers and do things themselves and do things very difficultly and hard so it takes a very long time for him for them to build the same societal levels that the ones with the robots are and there's a bit of a hindrance in that when it's discussing the the robot series and the spacer series on that because you know what if you had robotics would certain achievements been done a much um grander scale or easier scale if there was some kind of robotic moderation, if you will. So, Ivan Abdanov was asked um, in 1964 to envision what 50 years in the future would be like to visit the World's Fair of 2014. And this is what he predicted by Isaac Abdanov. The New York World's Fair of 1964 is dedicated to peace through understanding. A glimpses of the world of tomorrow rule out thermonuclear warfare, and why not? If a thermonuclear war takes place, the future will not be worth discussing. So let the missiles slumber internally on their pads, and let us observe what may come in the non-atomized world of the future. What is to come? The fair's eyes, at least, it's wonderful. The direction in which man is traveling is viewed with a barnyard with hope, no more so than at the General Electric Pavilion. There the audience whirls through four scenes, each populated by cheerful, lifelike dummies that move and talk with a facility that inside of a minute and a half convinces you they are alive. The scenes are set about 1900, 1920, 1940, and 1960 and show the advances of electrical appliances and changes that are bringing in the living. I enjoy it hugely and only regret that they had not carried the scenes into the future. What will life be like, say, in 2014 AD, 50 years from now? What will the World's Fair of 2014 be like? I don't know, but I can guess. One thought that occurs to me is that men will continue to withdraw from nature in order to create an environment that will suit them better. By 2014, electroluminous panels will be in a common use. Ceilings and wall will glow softly in a variety of colors that will change at the touch of a push button. Windows need not be no more than an archaic touch and even when present will be polarized to block out the harsh sunlight. The degree of opacity of the glass may even be made to alter automatically in accordance with the intensity of the light falling upon it. There is an underground house at the fair which is a sign of the future. If its windows are not polarized, they can nevertheless alter the scenery by changing, by changes in lighting. Suburban homes underground with, with easily controlled temperature, free from the vicious tudes of weather, with air cleaned and light controlled, should be fairly common. At the New York World's Fair of 2014, General Motors Futurama may well display vistas of underground cities, complete with light, forest vegetable gardens, and the surface GM, GM will argue will be given over to large scale agriculture raising and parklands with less space wasted on actual human occupancy 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 occupation gadgetry will continue to relieve, to uh, relive mankind of relieve mankind of tedious jobs kitchen units will be devised that will pair auto meals heating water and converting it into coffee toasting bread frying poaching or scrambling eggs, grilling bacon, and so on. Breakfasts will be ordered the night before to be ready by a specified hour the next morning. Complete lunches and dinner with a few food semi-prepared will be stored in the freezer until ready for processing. I suspect, though, that even in 2014, it will still be advisable to have a small corner in the kitchen unit where the more individual meals can be prepared by hand, especially when company is coming. 
Robots will neither be common nor very good in 2014, but they will be in existence. The IBM exhibit at the present fair had no, robo no robots, but it is dedicated to computers, which are shown in all their amazing complexity. Nobody in the task of translating Russian into English. If machines are that smart today, what may not be in the works 50 years hence? It will be such computers much miniarized, they mi much miniarized, Smaller. They will serve as the brains of robots. In fact, the IBM building at the 2014 World's Fair may have as one of its prime exhibits a robot housemate, housemate large, clumsy, slow-moving, but capable of general of picking up, arranging, cleaning, and manipulation of various appliances. It will undoubtedly amuse the far, fair goers to scatter debris over the floor in order to see the robot, lumbering and remove it and classifying it to throw away and set aside. Robots for gardening will also have made their appearance. General Electric at the 2014 World's Fair will be showing 3D movies of its robots of the future, neat and streamlined, and its cleaning appliances built in and performing all tasks briskly. There will be a three hour wait in line to see the film, for some things never change. The appliance of 2014 will have no electric cords, of course, for they will be powered by long lived batteries running on. Radiostope, radiostopes, and the isotopes will not be expensive for they will be byproducts of the fusion power plants which by 2014 will be supplying well over half the power needs of humanity. But once the isotope batteries are used up, they will be disposed of only through authorized agents of the manufacturer. An experimental fusion power plant of two or two will already exist in 2014. Even today, a small but Genuine fusion explosion is demonstrated at frequent intervals in the GE exhibit at the 1964 fair. Large solar power stations will also be in operation in a number of desert and semi desert areas Arizona, the Navi, uh, Kazakhstan. In more crowded, but cloudy, and smoggy areas, solar panels will be less practical. The exhibit at the 2014 fair will show models of power stations in space collecting sunlight by means of huge parabolic focusing devices and radiating, radiating energy, thus collecting down to Earth. The world of the 50 years hence will have shrunk further. At the 1964 fair, the GM exhibits depicts, among things, road building factories in the tropics and closer to home. Crowded highways along with long buses move on special central lanes. There is a very likelihood that highways, at least in the more advanced sections of the world, will have passed their peak in 2014. There will be increasing emphasis on trans transportation that makes the least possible contact with the surface. There will be aircraft, of course, but even grounded travel will be increasingly take to the air a foot or two off the ground. Visitors to the 1964 fair can travel there in an aquafoil, which lifts itself on four stilts and skims over the water with a minimum of friction. This is surely a stopgap. By 2014, the four stilts will have been replaced by four jets of compressed air, so that the vehicle will make no contact with either liquid or solid surface. Jets of compressed air will also lift land vehicles off the highway, which among other things will minimize paving problems. Smooth earth or level lawns will do as well as pavements. Bridges will also be less, in, less important since cars will be capable of crossing water on their jets through local ordinance will discourage the practice. Much effort will be put into the design of the vehicles with robot brains. Vehicles that can be set a practical, practical destination and will then proceed there without interference by slow reflexes of human driver. I suspect one of the major attractions of the 2014 fair will be rides on small robot, roboticized cars, which will maneuver in crowds at the two foot level, neatly and automatically avoiding each other. For a short for short-range travel, moving sidewalks with benches on each side, gaining room in the center, will be making their appearance in downtown sections. They will be raised above traffic, and traffic will continue on several levels in some places, only because all parking will be off-street and because at least 80% of truck deliveries will be to certain fixed centers at the city's rim. Compressed air tubes will be carry, carry goods and materials over local stretches, and the switching devices that will that will place specific shipments in specific destinations will be one of the city's marvels. Communication will be sight and sound, and you will see as well as hear the person you telephone. The screen can be 
used not only to see people you call, but also studying documents and photographs and reading passages from books. A synchronized satellite hovering in space will make it possible for you to direct dial any spot on Earth, including the weather station in Antarctica, as shown in Chile's splendor, the part of the 64 General Motors exhibit. For the matter, you will be able to reach some of the moon colonies concerning which General Motors puts on display of impressive vehicles in model form with large soft tires intended to negotiate the uneven terrain that may exist on natural satellite. A number of simultaneous conversations between Earth and Moon can be handled by modulated laser beams, which are easy to manipulate in space. On Earth, however, laser beams will have to be led through plastic pipes, devoid of material, and as an as and astrophoric interference, engineers will still be playing with the problem in 2014. Conversations with the moon will be trifle uncomfortable, by the way, and in in that 2.5 seconds must elapse between statement and answer to take flight that long to make the round trip. Similar conversations with Mars will experience a 3.5 minute delay, even when Mars is at its closest. However, by 2014, only unmanned ships will have landed on Mars. Though a manned expedition will be in the works, and a 2014 Futurama, Futurama will show a model of an elaborate Martian colony. As for television, wall screens will have replaced the ordinary set by transparent cube, cubes, will be making their appearance in which three-dimensional viewing will be possible. In fact, one popular exhibit of the 2014 World's Fair will be such a 3D TV built life-size in in which a ballet performs will be seen. The cube will slowly evolve for viewing them from all angles. One can can go on indefinitely in this happy extrapolation, but all is not rosy. As I stood in line waiting to get to the General Electric exhibit in the, at the 1964 fair, I found myself staring at the equable life grim sign blinking out the population of the United States with a number over 190 million increasing by one every 11 seconds during the intervals which I spent inside the GA pavilion. The American population increased by nearly 300 and the world's population by 6,000. In 2014, there's a very likelihood that the world's population will be 6.5 billion and the population of the United States will be 350 million. Boston to Washington, the most crowded area of its size on Earth, will have become a single city with a population of over, 400, over 40 million. Population pressure will force increased penetration of the desert and popular and, and polar areas. Most surprising, in some ways heartening, 2014 will see a good be made in the colonization of the continental shelves. Underwater housing will have its attractions to those who like water sports and will undoubtedly encourage the more efficient exploration of ocean resources, both food and mineral. General Motors shows in the 1964 exhibit the model of an underwater hotel of what might be called mouth-watering luxury. The 2014 fair will be exhibit showing cities in the deep sea with um, basket liners carrying men and, and supplies across and into the abyss. Ordinary agriculture will keep with great difficulty and there will be farms turning to the most efficient microorganisms. Processing yeast and algae products will be available in the variety of flavors. The 2014 fair will feature an algae bar in which mock turkey and pseudo steaks will be served. It won't be bad at all if you can dig up those premium prices, but there will be considerable psychological resistance to such an innovation. Although technology will still keep up with the population through 2014, it will only be through a supreme effort and with partial success. Not all the world's population will enjoy the gadgetary world of the future to the full. A large portion then today will be deprived, and although they may be better off materially than today, They'll be further behind when compared with advanced portions of the world. They will have moved backwards relatively. Nor can technology continue to match population growth, if that means unchecked, considering Manhattan in 1964, which has a population density of 80,000 per square mile at the night, and of course 100,000 per square mile during the working day. If the whole Earth, including the Sahara, the Himalaya Mountains, Peaks, Greenland, Antarctica, and every square mile the the ocean bottom to the deepest abyss were as packed as Manhattan that knew. Surely you would agree that no there's no way to support such a population, let alone make it comfortable, was conceivable. In fact, support would fail long before the world Manhattan was reached. Well the Earth population is now about three 
billion is doubling every 40 years. If the rate of doubling goes unchecked, then the world Manhattan is coming in just 500 years. All Earth will be single choke Manhattan by AD 2450 and society will collapse long before that. There are only two general ways of preventing this. One, raise the death rate. Two, lower the birth rate. Undoubtedly, the world of a to the greater D 2014 will have agreed on the latter method. Indeed, increasing the use of mechanical devices to replace failing hearts and kidneys and repair shifting arteries and breaking nerves will cut the death rate still further and have lifted the life expectancy in some parts of the world to age 85. There will therefore be a worldwide propaganda drive in favor of birth control by rational and human and humane methods and by 2014, it will undoubtedly have some, taken serious effect. The rate of increased population will have slackened, but I suspect not sufficiently. One of the most serious exhibits in 2014's fair, accordingly, will be a series of lectures, movies, and documentary, documentary material on the World Population Control Center, adults only, and special showings for teenagers. The situation will have been made that, that more serious by the advance of automation. The world of AD 2014 will have fo few routine jobs that cannot be done better by some machine by a human being. Mankind will therefore have become largely a race of machine tenders. Schools will have to be oriented in the direction, and part of the General Electric exhibit today consists of School of the Future, in which such present realities as closed circuit TV and program tapes aid the teaching process. It not only is not only the techniques of teaching that will advance, however, but also the subject matter that will change. All the high school students will be taught the fundamentals of computer technology will become proficient in binary arithmetic and will be trained for the perfection and use of computer language, languages that will have developed out of those like the contemporary forte for formula translation. Even so, mankind will suffer badly from the disease of boredom, disease spreading more widely each year and growing intensity. They will have serious mental, emotional, and psychological consequences, and I dare say that psychiatry will be far away the most important medical specialty in 2014. The lucky few who can be involved in greater work of any sort would be the true elite of mankind, for they alone would be more than served in machines. Indeed, the most somber, sobering speculation I, I can make about ED 2014 is that society of enforced leisure, the most glorious single word in the vocabulary, will become work. So, there was a lot of predictions that he had in there that came true, not so many as much. So... This comes from mental floss kind of breaking down some of those predictions. So one, the human race be incredibly, bo incredibly bored. In what uh, Asimov declared the most sobering speculation I can make about AD 2014, the writer believed society would fall into a sense of enforced leisure. Um, the lucky few would evolve in creative work and any sort would be truly elite to mankind. So, um... I'm not sure so much about that statement, but the rise of um, psychiatry did in fact come true, you can say, and I'm not sure it's necessarily a result of, result of boredom, more of an understanding of the human condition in general. Uh, appliances would no longer have electric cords. That is becoming increasingly true with now... Um, the application of Wi-Fi to be able to charge appliances, you're finding more and more of them are just battery um, powered with those lithium batteries. Uh, not, but the cord hasn't been completely cut. Uh, fusion power plants that would emerge that would energize most of the world. And we're not quite there yet. Uh, cars that would fly that still hasn't happened. There are robots. In the home, the Ruba is one of them. Um, there's everything from juicers to coffee makers to um, washing machines where you um, you put your wash in and as soon as your wash is done, it automatically loads into the dryer. Um, no moving sidewalks. Humans haven't colonized the moon. But we do send unmanned, uh, unmanned spacecraft, spacecraft to Mars. There are, um, there are a couple underwater stuff, but it's not the place where people live. Boston and Washington are not one big city. Life expectancy will hit 85 in some parts of the world. That's very much true. Uh, his human population predictors were not that far off. 
Um, I think he was off by a billion for the world population and like 50 million for the uh, United States. Let's see, I'm just kind of going through the article. Um, solar power, power is something that is being utilized um, out in the desert in remote areas. The um, self-driving car is something that he was predicting in transportation, but not necessarily um, the whole elevated transportation method is not something that's used. Uh, the whole compressed air thing, rockets, not so much going on there, but we do have drones, so that's more of a robotic thing, if you will. Um, the algae type burger type of stuff, um, well, that's more plant based. We are having, you know, um, lab created uh, foods that people are against. And the concept of that type of um, algae bar mock turkey stuff, um, you see that with some vegetarian stuff and tofu that people are kind of very against, but that does exist. Uh, he did get, get the communication um, in Skype. You can Skype Antarctica if you wanted to. Um, our phones are basically our walking computers that you can view down and see and read and listen if you will education in some parts of the world you are is part of the requirement in high school to learn um, computer languages it's becoming an increasing thing and requirement and almost a mandate um, learning computer uh, languages is you want to be like learning how to read and write is a, a basic requirement to be able to obtain some form of job if you will in the future um, economic uh, quality we kind of predicted that the same issues that were happening then are still happening now. There are parts of the world where they are very much behind, but because of mobile devices, um, not as much. Well, they might not have the same affluence and the same level of certain technologies, but because of the internet and because of those type of communication devices, they're not as far behind as that Asimov was predicting. So that's, you know, just kind of a thumbnail sketch of Isaac Abinoff. Um, on Herosa's Thought Bubble, we will review some of his books in more in depth, if you will. Uh, but he did have an influence just in, in the science fiction realm and because of the existence. Some of the aesthetics about robotics and the notion of human existence and the things that, you know, some of the big three didn't quite touch as much as... Um, some people like in their science fiction writing as you know about women and the social economic problems and certain political issues if you will um, were kind of counter addressed um, in um, in cyberpunk them but kind of took a more realistic approach to technology and an understanding of what could actually indeed happen instead of this not necessarily utopia but a futuristic unrealistic thinking of how the world would be um, the two you know like i stated earlier the two biggest things to take from him is his concept of robotics which is um influenced people's thinking about robots and automation and how they, they're utilized in society and ethics ethical dilemmas that are brought up with the use of robots and um the concept of longer life and how one should um uh, engage or an act in, in long life i i don't think boredom is something that the human condition is even long termly as a society can suffer from but it's something that people do think particularly when they think of you know all the entertainment that we have that we're really just bored and are not doing much or functioning or finding some kind of worthwhile fulfillment and the other thing is the usage of data mining, prediction of the human condition, condition in a massive way and be able to predict it and then manipulate it into, um, into the way that um, suits your, your, your needs. Um, in the foundation series, it, it talked about it, it was called the Selden Plan. And then it talked about how you can't predict everything, which is the rise of the mule character who was an individual that... Uh, was there something that predicted that individuals couldn't really 
um, alter the entire course of mat on a massive scale of human existence. So that's it um, on Asimov. Just have a couple of things um, about building your own. So a great Reddit thread, uh, I should say subreddit, that talks about um, how you can build your own PC. I have a link in the show notes to it. Um, you can also, um, there's a link in the show notes of how a, a guide, if you will, on how to build and generate in a very simplified fashion and different types of price ranges on how you can uh, build your own uh, PC if you choose to do so. Different styles, um, whether it be for gaming, for business, um, for your own, um, just maybe you just need to hook up to the internet and that's it. Very cheaply done to you know the top of the line if you want to. As well as how-to guides um, done in very simplified fashions, even visualized YouTube videos are both in the subreddit and even on the link on this uh, Choose My PC uh, site. Organizations that you can support is IEEE, Advanced Technology for Huma Humanity, uh, the world's largest technical professional organization for advancement technology. Uh, they have standards and spectrums that talk about uh, everything on, 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 on um, technology in of itself research papers and conferences they're very big in the tech field as an organization they do a lot of talk about engineers governments how technologies can be utilized what people can do it's worthwhile checking out and you can always donate and contribute if you like to uh, the three laws are the following uh, the first law is a robot may not injure a human being or through inaction allow a human being to come to harm. A robot must obey orders given it by humans except where such orders would conflict with the first law. And the third law is a robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or second law. And this is something you might have seen or have talked about in um, you know popular culture and even with uh, discussion about robotics today as far as um, them being weaponized or used in the home or things of that nature if there are some type of ethical laws or dilemmas to prevent robots from you know turning on their masters if you will. Uh, the murder mystery of the, clave of the Caves of Steel was Asimov's first big success as a novelist. In this book, the victim is a robotics, robotics, roboticist from Aurora, the first of 50 planets colonized by explorers from Earth, uh, dubbed Spacers. The first colonists were selected for their abilities and so were healthier than average. Their ships were sterilized and so brought no disease with them. The Spacers had become sort of a galactic upper class, more technologically, technologically advanced and military powerful than those left on the overpopulated, resource-strained Earth. While Earthlings lived at about the same age we experience today, the Spacers expected much lengthier lifespans. The contrast is highlighted by Eli, uh, Elijah Bailey, a police detective on Earth, and Hans uh, Fossa, an Aurorian politician who was a colleague of the murdered victim. Uh, Fast Luth expects to live to be between uh, 300 and 350, but he is wary of the drawbacks of such a long life. If you were to die now, he says to Bailey, you would lose perhaps 40 years of your life, probably less. If I were to die, I would lose 150 years, probably more. Uh, Fast Luth goes on to sketch out for Bailey the most the mores of Auroran society. The birth rate is kept low. Developing children are carefully screened for physical and mental defects before being allowed to mature, and humans constitute a sort of leisure class with all the labor done by robots. Uh, Bailey is horrified by all this, but not for the same reasons as uh, Fastluth, who is troubled by his society's sustainability. It's possible to be, to be too stable, he says, in a roaring culture. Individual life is of prime importance. Aurorans are, in his view, unable to collaborate with one another, and too risk averse because of their longevity. Um, Asenov followed the Caves of Steel three years later with The Naked Sun, in which Bailey travels to Solora, another spacer world, 
Whereas Aurora boasts 50 robots for every person, on Solor there are 10,000 for each individual. On Solor there's a strong taboo against physical contact, which is thought to be inherently dirty, and the 20,000 residents view one another by, by sort of a hologram video conference. Solorians, even more than Aurorans, are devoted to individual comforts, and Solorians, in their splendid isolation, have no police detective. That's why they called on Bailey for mirth. Until the murder of the murder of the story, they claim to have come to have uh, no crime. We are in Solarian have no experience with these things in the ways we don't understand people. There are too few of us here, a Solarian leader tells Bailey. Uh, the Solarians are individuals wealthy and long lived, but they do not innovate or really love. Uh, Bailey returns to Earth and reports to his superiors. When you ordered me to Solara, you asked a question. You asked what the weakness of the outer worlds were. Their strengths were their robots and their low population and long lives. But what were their weaknesses? And Bailey paused before delivering his punchline. The weakness, sir, are their robots, their low population, and their long lives. Uh, it took Asinoff 30 years to complete his trilogy with The Robot of Dawn, published in 1983, which takes place on Aurora. Uh, Bailey goes to Aurora to solve the murder of a robot. On his trip there, he heads up. He reads up on the planet's history. As the roaring lifespan grew longer over the course of generations, he finds their history grows more and more boring. As they live longer and longer lives, Aurorians do less and less. A Solarian woman with whom he falls in love tells him, when you live several centuries, you have plenty of time to lose thousands of things. Be thankful for short life. Asimov, though, is concerned not with individual, but with macro effects of long life, which he portrays as, as, as studifying. Auroran scientists have three or three and a half, half centuries to devote to a problem, so that the thought arises that significant progress might be made in a time by solitary work. It becomes possible to feel a kind of intellectual greed to want to accomplish something on your own, and general advance is slow on space or worlds as a result. Uh, it's easy to dismiss as an imagination is unrealistic. Earth in the Caves of Steel had a population of 8 billion, scaling more than the present population. The only way to grow enough food to support the population is through giant vats of yeast. And Asinoff claims that the population is far too large for conventional agricultural to suffice. But much, but much of what he predicts resonates in small ways. Nobody now lives in isolation of Solaran, yet my office is filled with people who prefer to send emails to one another instead of walking 10 seconds to briefly converse. Uh, I suspect this is not atypical. The children of the privileged are raised in structured, sheltered environments that have more of common feel with Asimov's Aurora, filled with individual strivers, than they do with the Earth of Caves, in which kids roughhouse harmlessly, blowing off steam in a shinier version of the 1950s. His books are useful ethnological progress. Earth will never become Aurora, but the tonier parts of Silicon Valley are already starting to resemble it. As an honest view, part of task of science fiction, as the custom, the custom readers see the ideas of change to the knowledge that things will be different, and so help them to plan change with wisdom. And part of that wisdom is undertaking a healthy skepticism and technological fixes to problems like aging. Which is something, you know, it's very interesting. There's been a study that um, showed that uh, there's certain antigens in uh, teenagers' blood that if you give to an older person, it helps uh, reverse aging. And it's something that uh, is being studied about. And all these, there's all these different types of studies to try to stop aging. It's something that um, people are actively seeking to do. But... Part of the dystopian view here with the whole uh, automation or robotics is as in us, um, more of his space stories happen is he wrote more about this particular area as part of his robot series. Uh, the people known as spacers, um, there were two groups of humans. There were spacers and there were, um, I think they were called travelers. They They didn't believe in robotics. They believed that man should do their work themselves and not leave it to automation. And so they rejected robots and didn't allow robots on their own worlds. Um, especially when um, Earth didn't become as feasible um, in the robotic series. And um, <clears throat> when the Galactic Empire and the Foundation, the robots weren't feasible to be on their planet. Um, 
because of this human division, what ended up happening on the spacer worlds, like places like Aurora, and their long life is it, especially with um, Aurora, where they didn't allow for um, human contact, uh, in that uh, humans' existence or whatever you might you might call it. these group of people that it came to a point they would their home space and everything that needed to be done was fulfilled by the robots, their food, their growing, their electricity, their thinking, their education, uh, even their communication to eventually where they didn't really even communicate with other Aurorians. They just stayed within their own space and dwelled within their own world, um, alone amongst them by themselves, living a very long life. Um, their shape and form actually even changed to where it's more of a sedentary, where they didn't even move as much. They have, were living like a kind of a sedentary um, existence. And if you've ever seen the, that movie Wally by Disney, the, the Pixar movie, where um, the humans that lived up in space that Wally was serving as he was trying to clean up and find viable life, um, plant life on Earth that the humans that lived in the cruise ship kind of lived that kind of aurora existence where they didn't move much, that it was all about pleasure, if you will. It was all about uh, selfish pursuits. And they went around in these like kind of space age um, old people carts, the little traveling carts that older people have to utilize to get around the old people scooters. And there are some people that perceive that this could possibly in essence kind of happen one aspect with animation is that what are humans going to do with their existence particularly given the fact that we are living longer than previous human civilization you know aspects of human, human civilizations have and even as we progress longer where people are very active in their 70s and 80s where even 20 or 30 years ago you wouldn't see as many active 70 or 80 year olds or even 90 year olds, if you will. People, there's more and more people being found to have um, reaching towards 100. I believe the, it was just like two weeks ago, um, a woman um, was a, like the last person born um, in the 19th century. Uh, she passed away at 118 years old something of that nature she was born in eight, um, 1899 and so because of, of our longevity and the fact that we're living healthier lives that we're combating diseases with the fact that we're able to treat them even cure them to exist to some extent and the fact that automation is something that's becoming more pervasive in life the the viewpoint that technology will be this type of almost a utopia-ish type of space, if you will. It's it's very weird because um, in Asimov's novels, he demonstrates that technology allows for people to be in space and for them to have this animation and you have these robotics and you have um, all these things happening where they're, the spacers are extremely wealthy and have this very great privilege. But they also live very long lives and they don't really do much. So you have this really strange contrast, if you will. So with the robotic series, he explores the usage of the robots and automation and how it changes, how new problems arise within um, human society because of this automation. And then in his next big series, the Foundation series, which also ties into the um, Galactic Empire. Uh, Asimov thought of a concept of utilizing um, what he calls psychohistory, where it was a prediction of how to form and shape human existence. So this is from the Wicca, and then we'll get into it. Um, the Foundation series is a science fiction series of books written by Asimov. Um, for nearly 30 years, the series was a trilogy, Foundation, Foundation Empire, and Second Foundation. Um, and then he uh, began to add to the series in 1981 with two sequels, Foundation's Ed, Edge and Foundation and Earth, and two prequels, Prelude to Foundation 
and forward the foundation. The additions made references to events in Asimov's Robot and Empire series, indica indicating they were all in the same fictional universe. Uh, the premise of this series is that mathematician Harry Seldon spent his life developing a branch of mathematics known as psychohistory, a concept of mathematical psych psychology. Using the laws of mass action, it could predict the future by only, but only on a large scale. Seldon proceeded the imminent fall of the Galactic Empire, which encompassed the entire Milky Way, in a dark age lasting 30,000 years before a second great empire arises. Uh, Seldon's calcula calculations also show there's a way to limit this interim to just 1,000 years to ensure that the most the more favorable outcome and reduce human misery during the intervening period. Seldon created a foundation of talented artisans and engineers at the extreme end of the galaxy, essentially to preserve and expand on human collective knowledge and thus becoming the foundation for a new galactic empire. But actually to place a society in the way shown by his calculation to bring around the desired outcome, the Seldon plan, he also established a second foundation of psychohistorians, on which little is known to build on his work further and to keep the better known first foundation on his intended course. So basically this concept of human prediction if you will, this data mining of human existence and then predicting it out forward is something that people have been trying to do for centuries and it's something that mathematicians are, are attempting to do now where you see things like predicting um, algorithms to try to predict the next terrorist attack or predicting you know how the markets go up and down um, and so for some degree they're there are certain mathematical computations that can predict certain aspects, but they can't predict everything, if you will. It is always up, up to do certain degrees. Um, but as more and more information is inputted, and as these um, mathematical uh, computations get more refined, um, they're becoming more and more um, capable of predicting certain aspects of a problem or solution. Um, there's also the concept of the wisdom of the crowd where you allow people from all rocks of life to predict an outcome of something like who's going to win the Super Bowl, who's, um, you know, and you have like, what was it, the Patriots versus the Falcons and the wisdom of the crowd, you know, moved towards the Patriots and of course the Patriots won. And there's a certain probability aspect to that. Um, you see Arga, um, there's a couple blockchain technologies that wish to harness the, the mathematical concept of the wisdom of the crowd through the blockchain technology. And, you know, this concept of psychohistory, uh, this predictive algorithm concept, it was something that um, Asanoff developed and put forth in the world. And just the concept of data mining, if you will, which is what Selden, uh, Harry, uh, not Harry, but yeah, Harry Selden was doing to data mine, data mine human existence and coming with an algorithm to predict um, how human society should go forward and then try to shape it to something that's better. Instead of 30,000 years of darkness, it's only a thousand years. Um, has significant um, implications because data mining is done all the time. Our personal information is utilized by all sorts of different um, corporations to predict and determine like what type of ad buys we would go for, what are what best colors would be suited for a car, uh, things of that nature. Um, I believe Facebook did a did a thing where they did some data tinkering to push their users to one type of kind of viewpoint versus another. Uh, data mining was utilized in um, the state selection, the United States election during, um, on behalf of the uh, Trump campaign to target and figure out, you know, what voters are thinking and utilizing that data to implement whatever type of policies and ad buys and, you know, the ground campaign that they were doing um, in the election. And it's something that's done by corporations, by individuals, by people. And it's becoming an increasing um, math solution, if you will, to the human problem of swaying someone to, to predict what they will think or do. 
remove all that. So the reason why I bring up the uh, founda- found- foundation is that a lot of people compare um, or are beginning to pair- compare um, Trump to a character from this series of books. And this character is called the Mule. So the Mule is a fictional character from Isaac Avanos Foundation series and comes from Wicca. Um, one of the greatest conquerors of the galaxy has ever seen. Uh, he's a melatonin who has the ability to reach the minds of others and adjust their emotions individually or in mass using this capacity to constrict individuals to his cause. Not direct mind control per se, per se, but in subtle influence of the subconscious, individuals under the mule's influence behave otherwise normally, logic, memories, and personal personalities intact. This gives the mule the capacity to disrupt uh, Selden's plan by invading Selden's assumption that no single individual could have a measurable effect on the galactic social his- historical trends on their own, due to the plan relying on the predictable actions of a very large number of people. So... The Mule established his empire incrementally using past con- consequences to add new ones, first by mentally converting a pirate band to his allegiance, then a whole planet, then the military powerful kingdom of Kanagan, while obtaining the mental of converting the warlord of the planet Kanagan, and then the foundation. The Mule set up his short-lived galactic empire, the Union of Worlds, styling himself the first citizen of the Union, and making Kanagan his cap- um, capital planet. Eating up turn for a good time after the Mule's conquest of the foundation, and his trade compared to almost no one ever actually sees the mule or knows what he looks like. Uh, the foundation at the death of the Empire is a slow supplier of nuclear weaponry in the galaxy, and using this asset, the mule begins rapidly conquering surrounding territories, all which lack nuclear power, sweeping aside the remnants of the Galactic Empire centered on Neo Tantaran. So the mule was something that um, Selden's plan couldn't predict because his whole thing was about predicting the whole masses of human existence. That was the basis of the, his particular formula. And then you have this mule who um, comes in and just messes things up. So what does that have to do with Trump and why is he being compared to it? So many people, and I have a link in the article about it, um, they're comparing Trump to the mule in the sense that because so many people had predicted and all the algorithms and the polling um, and everything was that uh, Hillary Clinton was going to win the presidential election even before um, really any GOP candidate was announced even even though Trump announces candidacy very very early on I think it was like 2011 that he eventually wanted to run for the seat for 2016 I think actually officially declared in 2015 the fact that he came onto the scene he defeated all the different GOP candidates even though all the predictions either went from like Jeb to Rubio to um, whomever the the other Republican candidates were everyone but him was going to get the uh, Republican nomination and then he got the Republican nomination and then it was predicted he wasn't going to win against Hillary. And, and because he was, he's considered an outsider, a businessman, a bit, bit of a buffoon, a kind of clownish in appearance. These are certain characteristic attributes that are associated, that the mule presented himself so that people wouldn't take him seriously. But he's actually really a very clever and very powerful person. And that's why many people associate it, um, because the character in himself, the mule, um, is capable is in something that's an attribute that many associate with Trump is very manipulative type of a person able to persuade people to his cause and his side that uh, he's very much like the mule that he disrupted whatever perceived plan the um, that people had right in fact like you know the Democratic plan for Hillary to win uh, the Republican plan for either uh, Rubio or or Jeb Bush to win the Republican nomination, a disruptive force that none of the um, leading um, thinkers, if you will, the leading pollsters and the numbers uh, reflected um, his presence, if you will, to win. So that's why he is something that bantered around in that comparison. I don't think it's an apt comparison to him. 
but I can see you in for some people they can perceive that particularly if you're the thing of the thought that you know ever you know everything is very organized and controlled and then the elite control every single aspect from the town from the top bottom there was a plan in place to place Hillary Clinton in charge and that you know Trump disrupted that if you will in general you know as it added on had a very huge impact impact on science fiction writing his he basically invented the term robotics it was he who came up with the term his concepts about robotics and automation um, how technology could be a solution for um, the world's problems or something that was discussed throughout his robot series and spacer series the concept of psychohistory using in essence data mining if you will to kind of control a population or an outcome something that he presented himself um, throughout that series of books um, the, what was called the Selden plan to shape human existence is something that's being done today and well he was very optimistic in believing that humans can overcome their problems and issues and stuff like that a lot of his books do have a, a reflection, if you look at it, of a kind of a dystopian world. But you don't want to live in a world where everything's kind of planned out, where you lived, a, you know, 350 years and don't really do much. Uh, you don't engage or interact. Uh, robots do everything for you. Um, you have a society that rejects automation in a sense. Um, become travelers and do things themselves and do things very difficultly and hard so it takes a very long time for him for them to build the same societal levels that the ones with the robots are and there's a bit of a hindrance in that when it's discussing the the robot series and the spacer series on that because you know what if you had robotics would certain achievements been done and much um grander scale or easier scale if there was some kind of robotic moderation if you will so Eisen was asked um, in 1964 to envision what 50 years in the future would be like to visit the World's Fair of 2014 and this is what he predicted by Isaac Avanov the New York World's Fair of 1964 is dedicated to peace through understanding a glimpses of the world of tomorrow rule out thermonuclear warfare, and why not? If a thermonuclear war takes place, the future will not be worth discussing. So let the missiles slumber eternally on their pads, and let us observe what may come in the non-atomized world of the future. What is to come? To the fair's eyes, at least, it's wonderful. The direction in which man is traveling is viewed with a barnyard with hope, no more so than at the General Electric Pavilion. There the audience whirls through four scenes, each populated by cheerful, lifelike dummies that move and talk with a facility that inside of a minute and a half convinces you they are alive. The scenes are set about 1900, 1920, 1940, and 1960 and show the advances of electrical appliances and changes that are bringing in the living. I enjoy it hugely and only regret that they had not carried the scenes into the future. What will life be like, say, in 2014 AD, 50 years from now? What will the World's Fair of 2014 be like? I don't know, but I can guess. One thought that occurs to me is that men will continue to withdraw from nature in order to create an environment that will suit them better. By 2014, electroluminous panels will be in a common use. Ceilings and wall will glow softly in a variety of colors that would change with the touch of a push button. Windows need not be no more than an archaic touch and even when present will be polarized to block out the harsh sunlight. The degree of opacity of the glass may even be made to alter automatically in accordance with the intensity of the light falling upon it. There is an underground house at the fair which is a sign of the future. If its windows are not polarized, they can nevertheless alter the scenery by changing, by changes in lighting. Suburban homes underground with, with easily controlled temperature, free from the vicious tudes of weather, with air cleaned and light controlled, should be fairly common. At the New York World's Fair of 2014, General Motors Futurama may well display vi vistas of underground cities complete with light, 
forest vegetable gardens, and the surface GM GM will argue will be given over to large scale agriculture raising and parklands with less space wasted on actual human occupancy. 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 Occupation. Gadgetry will continue to to uh, relive mankind of relieve mankind of tedious jobs. Kitchen units will be devised that will pair auto meals, heating water and converting it into coffee, toasting bread, frying, poaching, or scrambling eggs, grilling bacon, and so on. Breakfasts will be ordered the night before to be ready by a specified hour the next morning. Complete lunches and dinner with a few food semi prepared will be stored in the freezer until ready for processing. I suspect, though, that even in 2014, it will still be advisable to have a small corner in the kitchen unit where the more individual meals can be prepared by hand, especially when company is coming. Robots will neither be common nor very good in 2014, but they will be in existence. The IBM exhibit at the present fair had no, robot, no robots, but it is dedicated to computers, which are shown in all their amazing complexity. Nobody in the task of translating Russian into English. If machines are that smart today, what may not be in the works 50 years hence? It will be such computers much miniarized, they much miniarized, smaller. They will serve as the brains of robots. In fact, the IBM building at the 2014 World's Fair may have as one of its prime exhibits a robot housemate, housemate large, clumsy, slow-moving, but capable of general of picking up, arranging, cleaning, and manipulation of various appliances. It will undoubtedly amuse the far fair goers to scatter debris over the floor in order to see the robot lumbering and remove it and classifying it to throw away and set aside. Robots for gardening will also have made their appearance. General Electric at the 2014's World's Fair will be showing 3D movies of its robots of the future, neat and streamlined in its cleaning appliances built in and performing all tasks briskly. There will be a three hour wait in line to see the film for some things never change. The appliance of 2014 will have no electric cords, of course, for they will be powered by long lived batteries running on radiostope, radiostopes, and the isotopes will not be expensive for they will be byproducts of the fusion power plants, which by 2014 will be supplying well over half the power needs of humanity. But once the isotope batteries are used, up, they'll be disposed of only through authorized agents of the manufacturer. An experimental fusion power plant of two or two will already exist in 2014. Even today, a small but genuine fusion explosion is demonstrated at frequent intervals in the GE exhibit at the 1964 fair. Large solar power stations will also be in operation in a number of desert and semi-desert areas: Arizona, the Navi, uh, Kazakhstan, and more crowded but cloudy and smoggy areas, solar panels will be less practical. The exhibit at the 2014 fair will show models of power stations in space collecting sunlight by means of huge parabolic focusing devices and radiating, radiating energy thus collecting down to Earth. The world of the 50 years hence will have shrunk further. At the 1964 fair, the GM exhibit depicts, among things, road building factories in the tropics and closer to home Crowded highways along with long buses move on special central lanes. There is a very likelihood that highways, at least in the more advanced sections of the world, will have passed their peak in 2014. There will be increasing emphasis on trans transportation that makes the least possible contact with the surface. There will be aircraft, of course, but even grounded travel will be increasingly take to the air a foot or two off the ground. Visitors to the 1964 fair can travel there in an aquafoil, which lifts itself on four stilts and skims over the water with a minimum of friction. This is surely a stopgap. By 2014, the four stilts will have been replaced by four jets of compressed air so that the vehicle will make no contact with either liquid or solid surface. Jets of compressed air will also lift land vehicles off the highway, which among other things will minimize paving problems. Smooth earth or level lawns will do as well as pavements. Bridges will also be less in, less important since cars will be capable of crossing water on their jets through local ordinance will discourage the practice. Much effort will be put into the design of the vehicles with robot brains. Vehicles that can be set a practical, practical destination and will then proceed 
there without interference by slow reflexes of human driver. I suspect one of the major attractions of the 2014 fair will be rides on small robot roboticized cars, which will maneuver in crowds at the two-foot level, neatly and automatically avoiding each other. For short, for short-range travel, moving sidewalks with benches on each side, gaining room in the center, will be making their appearance in downtown sections. They will be raised above traffic, and traffic will continue on several levels in some places, only because all parking will be off-street and because at least 80% of truck deliveries will be to certain fixed centers at the city's rim. Compressed air tubes will be carried carry goods and materials over local stretches, and the switching devices that will, that will place specific shipments in specific destinations will be one of the city's marvels. Communication will be sight and sound, and you will see as well as hear the person you telephone. The screen can be used not only to see people you call, but also studying documents and photographs and reading passages from books. A synchronized satellite hovering in space will make it possible for you to direct dial any spot on Earth, including the weather station Antarctica, shown in chilly splendor the part of the 64 General Motors exhibit. For the matter, you will be able to reach some of the moon colonies concerning which General Motors puts on display of impressive vehicles in model form with large soft tires intended to negotiate the uneven terrain that may exist on natural satellite. A number of simultaneous conversations between Earth and Moon can be handled by modulated laser beams, which are easy to manipulate in space. On Earth, however, laser beams will have to be led through plastic pipes, devoid of material, and as and as and atmospheric interference. Engineers will still be playing with the problem in 2014. Conversations with the Moon will be trifle uncomfortable, by the way. And in that 2.5 seconds must elapse between statement and answer. It takes flight that long to make the round trip. Similar conversations with Mars will experience a 3.5 minute delay, even when Mars is at its closest. However, by 2014, only unmanned ships will have landed on Mars. Though a manned expedition will be in the works, and a 2014 Futurama, Futurama will show a model of an elaborate Martian colony. As for television, wall screens will have replaced the ordinary set by transparent cube, cubes will be making their appearance in which three-dimensional viewing will be possible. In fact, one popular exhibit of the 2014 World's Fair will be such a 3D TV built life-size in, in which a ballet performance will be seen. The cube will slowly evolve for viewing them from all angles. One can, can go on indefinitely in this happy extrapolation but all is not rosy. As I stood in line waiting to get to the General Electric exhibit in the, at the 1964 fair, I found myself staring at the equable life grim sign blinking out the population of the United States with a number over 190 million, increasing by one every 11 seconds during the intervals which I spent inside the GA pavilion. The American population had increased by nearly 300 and the world's population by 6,000. In 2014, there is a very likelihood that the world's population will be 6.5 billion and the population of the United States will be 350 million. Boston to Washington, the most crowded area of its size on Earth, will have become a single city with a population of over, 400, over 40 million. Population pressure will force increased penetration in the desert and, popular, and, and polar areas. Most surprising, in some ways heartening, 2014 will see a good be made in the colonization of the continental shelves. Underwater housing will have its attractions to those who like water sports and will undoubtedly encourage the more efficient exploration of ocean resources, both food and mineral. General Motors shows in the 1964 exhibit the model of an underwater hotel of what might be called mouth-watering luxury. The 2014 fair will be exhibit showing cities in the deep sea with um, basket liners carrying men and, and supplies across and into the abyss. Ordinary agriculture will keep with great difficulty and there will be farms turning to the most efficient microorganisms. Processing yeast and algae products will be available in the variety of flavors. The 2014 fair will feature an algae bar in which mock turkey and pseudo steaks will be served. It won't be bad at all if you can dig up those premium prices, but there will be considerable psychological resistance to such an innovation.
Although technology will still keep up with the population through 2014, it will only be through a supreme effort and with partial success. Not all the world's population will enjoy the gadgetary world of the future to the full. A large portion then today will be deprived, and although they may be better off materially than today, they'll be further behind when compared with advanced portions of the world. They will have moved backwards relatively. Nor can technology continue to match population growth, if that means unchecked, considering Manhattan in 1964, which has a population density of 80,000 per square mile at night, and of course 100,000 per square mile during the working day. If the whole Earth, including the Sahara, the Himalaya Mountains, Peaks, Greenland, Antarctica, and every square mile of the, the ocean bottom to the deepest abyss were as packed as Manhattan that knew, surely you would agree that no, there's no way to support such a population, let alone make it comfortable, was conceivable. In fact, support would fail long before the world Manhattan was reached. Well, the Earth population is now about 3 billion billion is doubling every 40 years. If the rate of doubling goes unchecked, then the world Manhattan is coming in just 500 years. All Earth will be single choke Manhattan by AD 2040, 2450 and society will collapse long before that. There are only two general ways of preventing this. One, raise the death rate. Two, lower the birth rate. Undoubtedly, the world of a to the greater D 2014 will have agreed on the latter method. Indeed, increasing the use of mechanical devices to replace Failing hearts and kidneys and repair shifting arteries and breaking nerves will cut the death rate still further and have lifted the life expectancy in some parts of the world to age 85. There will therefore be a worldwide propaganda drive in favor of birth control by rational and human and humane methods and by 2014 it will undoubtedly have some, taken serious effect. The rate of increased population will have slackened but I suspect not sufficiently. One of the most serious exhibits in 2014's fair, accordingly, will be a series of lectures, movies, and documentary, documentary material on the World Population Control Center, adults only, and special showings for teenagers. The situation will have been made that, that more serious by the advance of automation. The world of AD 2014 will have four, few routine jobs that cannot be done better by some machine than by a human being. Mankind will therefore have become largely a race of machine tenders. Schools will have to be oriented in the direction, and part of the General Electric exhibit today consists of School of the Future, in which such present realities as closed-circuit TV and program tapes aid the teaching process. It not only is not only the techniques of teaching that will advance, however, but also the subject matter that will change. All the high school students will be taught the fundamentals of computer technology, will become proficient in binary arithmetic, and will be trained to perfection in use of computer language languages that will have developed out of those like the contemporary forte for formula translation. Even so, mankind will suffer badly from the disease of boredom, disease spreading more widely each year and growing intensity. They will have serious mental, emotional, and psychological consequences, and I dare say that psychiatry will be far away the most important medical specialty in 2014. The lucky few who can be involved in creative work of any sort would be the true elite of mankind, for they alone will be more than served in machine. Indeed, the most somber, sobering speculation I, I can make about AD 2014 is that society of enforced leisure, the most glorious single word in the vocabulary, will become work. So there was a lot of predictions that he had in there that came true, not so many as much. So this comes from mental floss kind of breaking down some of those predictions. So one, the human race be incredibly, bo incredibly bored. In what uh, Asimov declared the most sobering speculation I can make about AD 2014, the writer believes society would fall into a sense of enforced leisure. Um, the lucky few will evolve in creative work and any sort will be truly elite of mankind. So um, I'm not sure so much about that statement. But the rise of um, psychiatry did in fact come true, you can say. And I'm not sure it's necessarily a result of, result of boredom, more of an understanding of the human condition in general. Uh, appliances would no longer have electric cords. That is becoming increasingly true with now um, the application of Wi-Fi to be able to charge appliances. You're finding more and more of them are just battery um, powered with those lithium batteries, uh, not but the cord hasn't been completely cut. 
uh, fusion power plants that would emerge that would energize most of the world. And we're not quite there yet. Uh, cars that would fly, this still hasn't happened. There are robots in the home. The Ruba is one of them. Um, there's everything from juicers to coffee makers to um, washing machines where you um, you put your wash in and as soon as your wash is done, it automatically loads into the dryer. Um, no moving sidewalks. Humans haven't colonized the moon. But we do send unmanned, uh, unmanned spacecraft, spacecraft to Mars. There are, um, there are a couple underwater stuff, but it's not the place where people live. Boston and Washington are not one big city. Life expectancy will hit 85 in some parts of the world. That's very much true. Uh, his human population predictors were not that far off. Um, I think he was off by a billion for the world population and like 50 million for the uh, United States. Let's see, I'm just kind of going through the article. Um, solar power, power is something that is being utilized um, out in the desert in remote areas. The um, self-driving car is something that he was predicting as transportation, but not necessarily... Um, the whole elevated transportation method is not something that's used. Uh, the whole compressed air thing, rockets, not so much going on there, but we do have drones. So that's more of a robotic thing, if you will. Um, the algae type, burger type of stuff, um, well, that's more plant based. We are having, you know, um, lab created. Uh, foods that people are against and the concept of that type of um, algae bar mock turkey stuff um, you see that with some vegetarian stuff and tofu that people are kind of very against but that does exist uh, he did get, get the communication um, in Skype you can Skype Antarctica if you wanted to um, our phones are basically our walking computers that you can view down and see and read and listen if you will education in some parts of the world you are is part of the requirement in high school to learn um, computer languages wow. it's becoming an increasing thing and requirement and almost a mandate um, learning computer uh, languages is you want to be like learning how to read and write is a, a basic requirement to be able to obtain some form of job if you will in the future um, economic uh, quality, he kind of predicted that the same issues that were happening then are still happening now. There are parts of the world where they are very much behind, but because of mobile devices, um, not as much. Well, they might not have the same influence and the same level of certain technologies, but because of the internet and because of those type of communication devices, they're not as far behind as that Asimov was predicting. So that's, you know, just kind of a thumbnail sketch of Isaac Abinoff. Um, on Herosa's Thought Bubble, we will review some of his books in more in depth, if you will. Uh, but he did have an influence just in, in the science fiction realm and because of the existence. Some of the aesthetics about robotics and the notion of human existence and the things that, you know, some of the big three didn't quite touch as much as um, some people like in their science fiction writing as, you know, about women and the social economic problems and certain political issues, if you will, um, were kind of counter addressed um, in, um, in cyberpunk them, but kind of took a more realistic approach to technology and an understanding of what could actually indeed happen instead of this, not necessarily utopia, but a futuristic unrealistic thinking of how the world would be um, the two you know like i stated earlier the two biggest things to take from him is his concept of robotics which is um influenced people's thinking about robots and automation and how do they're utilized in society and ethics ethical dilemmas that are brought up with the use of robots and um the concept of longer life and how one should uh 
uh, engage or enact in, in long life. I, I don't think boredom is something that the human condition is even long termly as an anxiety can suffer from. But it's something that people do think, particularly when they think of, you know, all the entertainment that we have that we're really just bored and are not doing much or functioning or finding some kind of worthwhile fulfillment. And the other thing is the usage of data mining, prediction of the human condition in a massive way and be able to predict it and then manipulate it into um in the way that um, suits your 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 needs, um, in the foundation series it, it talked about it, it was called the Selden Plan, and then it talked about how you can't predict everything, which is the rise of the mule character, who was an individual that uh, was not something predicted that individuals couldn't really um, alter the entire course of ma- on a massive scale of human existence. So that's it um, on Asimov. Just have a couple of things um, about building your own. So a great Reddit thread, uh, I should say subreddit, that talks about um, how you can build your own PC. I have a link in the show notes to it. Um, you can also, um, there's a link in the show notes of how a, a guide, if you will, on how to build and generate in a very simplified fashion and different types of price ranges on how you can uh, build your own uh, PC if you choose to do so. Different styles, uh, whether it be for gaming, for business, um, for your own, um, just maybe you just need to hook up to the internet and that's it. Very cheaply done to you know the top of the line if you want to. As well as how-to guides um, done in very simplified fashions, even visualized YouTube videos are both in the subreddit and even on the link on this uh, Choose My PC uh, site. Organizations that you can support is IEEE, Advanced Technology for Humanity, uh, the world's largest technical professional organization for advancement technology. Uh, They have standards and spectrums that talk about uh, everything on on, 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 um, technology in of itself research papers, conferences, they're very big in the tech field as an organization. They do a lot of talk about engineers, governments, how technologies can be utilized, what people can do. It's worthwhile checking out and you can always donate and contribute if you like to. In our manifesto of the episode, it's called the Anti-Web 2.0 by Andrew Keen. The Anti-Web 2.0 The cult of the amateur is a digital utopian, most seductive delusion. The cult promises that the latest media technology in the form of blogs, wikas, and podcasts will enable everyone to become widely read writers, journalists, movie directors, and music artists. It suggests mistakenly that everyone has something interesting to say. The digital utopia much heralded uh, democratization of media will have a destructive impact upon culture, particularly upon criticism. Good taste is at door never tried, or telling us undemocratic. Taste must reside with elite truth makers as historical progressive cultural critics able to determine on behalf of the public the value of a work of art. The digital utopia seeks to flatten the elite into an oligarchy. The danger, therefore, is that the future will be tasteless. To imagine the dystopian future, we need to reread Adorn as well as Kafka and Borges. The Web 2.0 dystopia can be mapped up to the triangulated space between Frankfurt, Prague, and Buenos Aires. Unchecked, unchecked technology threatens to undermine reality and turn media into a rival version of life, a 21st century version of the castle or the library of Babel that might make a fantastic movie or a short piece of fiction, but real life like art shouldn't be fantasy, it shouldn't be fiction. A particularly unfashionable thought, big media is not bad news. The big media engine of the Hollywood studios, the major record labels, and the publishing houses have discovered and branded great 20th century popular artists of such as Alfred Hitchcock, Bono, Bono and W.G. Sobel, the Vertical Three. It's most unlikely the citizen media will have the marketing skills to discover and brand creative artists of unequivalent un- prod- prodigy. Let's think about George Orwell. 
Apple's iconic 1984 Super Bowl commercial and true, 1984 will not be 1984, the message went, yes, the truth. About the digital future will be the absent of the Orwellian big brother and the Ministry of Truth. Orwell, Orwell's dystopia is the dictatorship of the state. The Web 2.0 dystopia is the dictatorship of the author. In the digital future, everyone will think they are Orwell. The movie might be called Being George Orwell. The digital utopia economist Chris Anderson have invented a theoretical flattened market that they have Christian the long tail. It is a Hagen cottage market of small media producers industrious training with one another, but Andrew's long tail is a really long tail. The real economic future is something akin to Google, a virtuous media world in which content and advertising become so indistinguishable that they become one and the same. More grist to the Frankfurt Frog Buenos Aires Triangle. As always today, uh, pornography reveals tomorrow's media. The future of general media, the place culture is going, is voyeurweb.com, the convergence of self authored shameless narcissism and vulgarity, a self argument in favor of censorship. As Ordon liked to remind us, we have a responsibility to protect people from the worst impulses. If people aren't able to censor their worst instincts, they need to be censored by others wiser and more disciplined than themselves. There is something of the philosophy assumption of early Marx and Rousseau's in the digital utopia movement, particularly in the holy eternity of online community, individual creativity, and common intellectual property ownership. Most of all is the marriage of abstract theory and absolute faith in the future, the virtue of human nature that lands that digital utopia their intellectual debt to the intellectual Casanovas like Young, Marx, and, Rous and Rousseau. How to resist digital utopianism? Orwell focused on language in the most effective antidote. The digital utopia is to be fraught word for word, phrase by phrase, delusion by delusion. As an open gamut, let's focus on the meaning of the four key words in the digital utopia lexicon. A. Author. B. Audience. C. Media. Community, B. Elitism. Um, elitism. 10. The cultural consequence of an uncontrolled digital development will be social vertical. Culture will be spinning and whirling in the con continual flux. Everything will be in motion. Everything will be opinion. The social vertical or the ubiquitous op opinion was recognized by Plato. That's why he was of the opinion that opinionated artists should be banned from his republic. And this came out April 25th, 2007. And that is it for the episode. Uh, thank you for listening. I am logging off from now, and perhaps I will see you somewhere out on the street. Thank you for listening. Please rate and review either through iTunes or Stitchers or any of the podcasting apps that you're currently using to listen to this show. Thank you, and until next time. This has been a Herosha Shine Space Odyssey Network production.